Wow, uh, quite a few people at the beginning. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning for uh, some of you on the West Coast. I think it's afternoon for everybody at this point. And good evening, Italy. Good evening. Good evening, good evening guys. Uh, so, I don't know how many we're going to have uh, today. Um, we were expecting a, you know, a good uh, few dozens. Um, but let me just uh, introduce um, myself, um, uh, Grassi, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, and the concept and the idea behind this presentation. So I've been working with Grassi for you know, quite a few times. And um, during this downtime, I know them for longer than that, of course. And during this down period, since we can't really visit the customer or friends, uh, um, we decided to uh, start this experience of the, uh, of the seminar and the presentation. Um, we decided to have this chat and uh, I'm not a professor, I'm not a teacher, I'm actually a sales rep in the East Coast. Uh, um, so most of you probably won't interact with me, uh, but I'm available if you have some questions. I live in the uh, New York metropolitan area and this is why I'm hosting the presentation here in the United States. Um, and the idea is basically to talk about Palladio and to talk about uh, the stone, the formation, why our stone, and you know, the benefit, the pros and cons. Um, we certainly are doing this because eventually we would like to generate more business, more interest, uh, but it's not the sales pitch, so I don't have any catalog price list. Uh, um, and um, it's, it wants to be more like an educational for as much as we can do uh, on um, how the stone generated, a little bit of a background on Palladio and its influence in the United States. And hopefully, like I said, stimulate the, um, uh, the use of uh, this stone in, in this market. Uh, Maria Vittoria is the owner of Grassi Pietre. Um, she worked uh, with um, her brother in putting together the draft. I kind of modified here with the help of Giacomo um, that translated the original verses in Italian and they helped me with the uh, slides and some information. And I'm here basically reading what they put together. So Maria Vittoria and Giacomo, if you want to just say a few words to introduce yourself, uh, you know, go ahead and okay. then we start the same. Hi to everybody. Uh, well, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. Of course, I would love to have you here in Italy. That's not a possibility right now. So that's what we're doing. And we hope you will enjoy anyway the time that we spend together. Hoping, you know, that's just the first meeting on, on a screen and then it will be follow something more concrete in the future. Giacomo? Yeah, sorry. I am the, the one on the black mirror because today is the Labor Day. So my camera decided not to, to work today. But it's anyway welcome anyone okay all right well thank you Giacomo and uh, Maria Vittoria uh, just um, you know a few housekeeping rules uh, uh, because there's uh, quite a few people we mute all of you um, but like I said uh, I'd like to have it as interactive as possible so if you have some interest or request or some details they would like me or Maria Vittoria and Giacomo to uh, dive deeper into that uh, unmute yourself, interact, um, there's a chat box. I don't know if you're all familiar with that. Maria Vittoria can certainly help you on this. And I think this is the only way to make this presentation um, and my life will be easier. Um, I'm okay, I'm, I suppose, in presenting, but doing it on virtual is not as easy as seeing you live and see whether I'm boring you or uh, you know, you're interested. So. If you don't have any other uh, requests, I would say, you know, let's get started and you tell me whether I should uh, speed up or uh, slow down or, you know, dive a little bit deeper on this. So, um, starting from uh, where we are, I don't know how many of you, you know, I suppose a few have a relationship with Italy, some have been or uh, lived or... Uh, would plan on living in Italy. Um, I actually come from this area. Uh, you see, this is my uh, Google map uh, uh, screenshot. And um, I'd like to give you a little parameters because I think geography is important in the course of this presentation and I don't want to toggle back and forth from this event. I have to screen, so I apologize if I don't actually look into the mirror, but sometimes I have to look at uh, what I'm doing. Um, so. The Berici Hill are uh, the hills of where the quarries uh, are located, and this is red silk over here. But uh, 
um, the formation uh, actually had influence along all these, uh, which is the Padana Valley. Uh, sorry, again, uh, like I said, uh, touching the screen uh, happens. Um, so you see here that uh, we have the Alps, uh, we have the Apennines. This is all the Padana Valley, which was formed by the Po River. Po is the, the longest river you can really see at this uh, depth of screen, I mean, depth of uh, zoom in, in Google. Uh, but there's a river that starts more or less here, goes through Turin. Turin in the 1800 that was the capital of Italy and uh, has some relative importance importance throughout the course of this presentation. Uh, Milan has never been a capital, but of course uh, has always been uh, uh, the major trading and business center, even in uh, medieval time, uh, as long as with Florence, which is down here in the Tuscany area. We won't be talking too much about that, but definitely Florence has always been an important uh, um, center in the, uh, in the Renaissance in particular. And, you know, talking about our region, um, primarily uh, Venice, uh, Vicenza, that's where we are. Padova, where um, most of this uh, friendship uh, um, Palladio experience was in Padova. Uh, Verona, I mean, I'm sure if you are in the stone industry, you know where that is located. And hopefully you, you know, you'll be able to join us at the Marble Mac. And, uh, you know, we can't discount uh, Carrara. And we can't talk about stone without uh, mentioning Carrara. So uh, this is pretty much the, the framework of uh, where we are. Um, so we will be talking about the quarry at the beginning, uh, focusing primarily on ours, um, but I'd like to explain you also the two differences. And if you look at this map here, you will see that the Alps uh, have, the mount, uh, have the snow on top of the mountains, which is the white over here. And that's because of the altitude of the, of the, uh, of the Alps. Massa and, and Carrara, these are the Apuani Alps, don't have, although they're still called Alps, they're technically the Apennines, and don't have the same elevation of, of the Alps. So the Y that you actually see here, and you, we will see later on in a couple of slides, uh, where I basically zoomed in, and which is great because you can actually do it yourself from your own computer, uh, you can actually see the, uh, the quarries from here. So uh, I hope I recall uh, pretty much everything, and uh, I'm moving on to the, um, to the quarries, the definition of the two quarries, and uh, give you a distance reference where we are, where are the factors. Um, typically, it has always been like this in the past. There's the quarry, which is where the, the, the rock is extracted. And uh, there's a second area where the rock is transformed, is carved, is cut. Uh, and of course, you know, because the geological, con the geography conformation of the territory usually are not exactly in the same place, but they tend to be and they need to be as close as possible because especially back in the time, you know, we're transporting stone. We are not transporting uh, paper, uh, which actually weighs quite a bit if you compile them together. But anyway, um, you know, especially in the, all the way up to the 1950, basically, when, you know, we started using more of mechanical transportations and mechanical uh, um, machinery before everything was manual and um, horses and oxes. So this is why I, although the quarry that we're using the most is actually here, which you can see from the map is about 22 minute car ride. So, you know, probably half an hour on a truck and it's about 10 mile distance. Um, here in Nanto is where another quarry is located. And you can see that the uh, here is actually where I Google um, the quarry and where I Google the, uh, this is the address of Grassi Pietro, the offices. The offices and the laboratory, of course. And, and you can see that, that the first one was actually here because, you know, transporting back then by, by foot or by horses uh, blocks for uh, 10 miles, it was certainly a challenge. Uh, so this is actually one of the quarry that has been uh, work uh, extensively in the past. Uh, it's still open, we can still extract material, but not as much nowadays, and we will explain you better uh, later on. Uh, the main reason, in a nutshell, is because in the past, you were working in a very inefficient way with a lot of leftover wastages and messy situation. 
Um, so unless we really need to, or for some specific reason, we prefer to work on, on other quarry that are not too far out. That being said, uh, um, here is the shot of uh, the aerial view, again, still from Google. And I took a little description from uh, the National Geographic uh, to explain you what are the two kind of quarries. Uh, and for, uh, I mean, I suppose for the majority of you, I don't know your background, and, um, but supposedly you're interested in stone, you're working in stone, maybe you're an architect. Um, most likely you are an importer or a trader or an installer. Uh, and in that case, uh, you have been into a quarry if you're working with stone. Most of the time, and that's been actually my experience, there's always been an open quarry, um, which is the typical quarry you will see uh, in Carrara, because you know, I'll, I'll explain you why. Although even in Carrara, they have some of these tunnel quarries. But the peculiarity of the grassy um, quarries is that they are all into a tunnel. Um, and we will go later into the explanation why, uh, but this is a pretty unique peculiarity and uh, I can guarantee it's impressive um, to walk into one of these. And this is also the reason why we call this um, episode of the seminars of this Palagio talk, we call it um, Stone Cathedral, uh, because they actually really look like a cathedral and once you will see the picture, you will, uh, you will see it better. Um, but um, another analogy that I want to make, and particularly the art that probably are, are, are connected to that, is that the same way that you're doing your design, you're doing your calculation for uh, building uh, your, uh, your building, your, your projects, is pretty much exactly the same, but in the reverse uh, for uh, people that are pouring the material, especially the ones that are doing in the tunnel. Because if you think about it, it's basically removing material versus you are adding material in order to erect, we are removing in order to pour it. So um, normally, and, but I couldn't dare to change the National Geographic uh, um, definition, uh, but I normally in the industry, I hear about a tunnel quarry. Um, National Geographic call it subsurface mine. Um, and this is basically what you see, is you will see later on uh, uh, more in details. The other one, and the one over here, is the open pit mine, uh, which I normally hear about the open air quarry. And this is exactly the same uh, uh, Google map I was showing you three uh, slides before, where the white circle, I just uh, click uh, all down here until it's zoom in on the quarry. And you can actually see here um, that, and actually I could zoom even further but I want to give you a little bit of a view that rather than actually going inside the quarry. But if you can actually zoom further, I cannot do it from here because the picture is not really um, the, the Google. Uh, you can actually go inside the quarry. You can already see the streets in the quarry here versus here, the, the regular uh, uh, municipality of the streets. Um, so these are the two, um, the two areas, I mean, the two, the two kinds of quarries. Going into uh, our regions, um, this is the what you will see today. And um, you know, I'd like to highlight this also as a good opportunity um, because um, you saw it before in the map. Uh, I was kind of actually, I'm coming from an area not that far away. I mean, not that far away today's technology. So with a car, I kind of used to live in, in the Emilia area, uh, which is about two hour drive uh, from, from the Vicenza, from the Berici Hills. So I have to admit, I never really um, had that many opportunity to, uh, to travel there until I started working more and more with the uh, Grassi Pietre. And even from the highway, this, especially the one here on top, can very well be uh, the view that you see usually on my left side on the, uh, on the highway when I'm going east, so towards Venice coming from, uh, from Verona. And that's typically what you see. You see um, towers, you see castles, you see uh, old villages. Uh, at the same time, you see the... Uh, vineyards, landscape, lakes. Uh, so it's certainly a good uh, day break uh, if you are uh, there for business or um, even a getaway from the typical, uh, I don't want to say tourist trap because Venice is certainly not a tourist trap, but it, it certainly, you know, you will see a lot of tourists in Venice. Over here, probably you get to experience more of uh, what um, the typical lifestyle of the Italian day. I mean, here there's probably in a day like Saturday, like today, you will find Italians. You won't find many of the Americans or the Chinese taking pictures. And in this landscape, 
um, you start seeing also the majority of the Palladio architecture, uh, because most of this uh, art are actually in those uh, hills and valleys and, um, you know, of course, a lot into Vicenza. Um, so starting from Palladio, uh, you know, talking a, a little bit about him, and uh, again, I don't have a lot of background histories, but I did a little bit of research and uh, I rely also on what you can gather on the grassy website. Um, the Villa La Rotonda is probably the most famous villa. Many of the other villa more or less have this kind of image because this is basically the imprinting of this uh, design and this kind of architecture. So we started from this one and again, I mean, besides architecture, here is a great uh, countryside as you can see from the picture to, to enjoy it. And uh, many of the villa are in this kind of setting and landscape uh, and um, I took a little, again, another shot from the Buchiello because um, it's another way of tourism. Uh, it's basically this boat that starts in Padua and goes all the way to Venice, uh, going through, this, uh, through that, this canal and crossing through all these little villages. And along the way, you had here, I like the different villa that Palladio has um, designed in, uh, in this uh, history. Um, uh, Vicenza, of course, is, you know, if you don't have time, it's the, the perfect place to uh, get uh, sucked in in all this uh, architecture and landscape. I mean, this is uh, Piazza dei Signori, I believe it's called. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Maria Vittoria. No, it's perfect. Uh, correct. Uh, this is Basilica Palladiana, and, you know, it's probably the first thing, if not the second, that, that you see as soon as you walk into downtown, you park the car and just you walk in. Um, it was... For me, it was only one evening, but I can guarantee that in two, three hours, having dinner there is definitely an enjoyable uh, um, time spent. Uh, but, um, you know, if you have the weekend, I mean, shops are all over here, um, you know, hopefully when everything goes back to normal, and it certainly is worth spending even a weekend or longer, the um, Teatro Olimpico. This is the, the, the view up here. I remember I had the cocktail with the peritids and it's just a regular bar. But I mean, sitting on a bar uh, um, up and on a setting like this, um, there's nothing to regret uh, in Piazza San Martin in Venice. Um, definitely you have exactly the same feeling, but like I said, probably with less tourists and less congestion and maybe cheaper drinks. Um, definitely. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I remember a $15 tea in uh, Piazza San Marco, and that was uh, 20 years ago. Um, last night, I, because the more I'm preparing and doing this, the more I actually get sucked in into the, um, into the uh, you know, into learning more, into experiencing more. And I found this article that is a, a great segue, basically, in what we are doing, because uh, most of the uh, influence here in the, in the United States is also uh, thanks to uh, Thomas Jefferson that uh, was a big fan of uh, Palladio architecture and, um, and uh, his masterpieces. I mean, he calls and uh, I just highlighted that some of the points from the article and, uh, you know, I hope I don't get uh, sued by the New York Times, but here are all the credit. And again, you go on Google, I just copy and paste it here. Uh, sort of the key point of what the article says, um, and uh, here is that the Palladio, although the time doesn't really match, so, you know, you need, I don't remember exactly how the article was framing, but complained that basically Jefferson never really traveled to the Veneto regions, although he was a big fan of uh, Palladio. He called the four books of architecture like his Bible. Um, but he did travel quite because you will say, well, I mean, back then it wasn't that easy to go to Italy. Um, but he actually mentioned, I think, somewhere here, and I can't really find it, uh, and it's not this important. Uh, but he mentioned a couple of times, uh, not a couple of times, but he mentioned that um, actually Jefferson traveled to Lombardy and Piedmont, which, if you remember, the very first map uh, were more on the west where Milan and, and uh, Turin is, uh, which you know, in uh, those days, uh, traveling time, I would assume probably is a day or two, what the, today is um, four hours, five hours from, uh, from Vicenza to, uh, to Turin. But once you travel or sailed, I suppose that was the only means of transportation, you sailed from the United States to Italy, 
you know, how long does it take to add an extra half a day? And most likely he was going to pass to, um, to Piedmont and to Turin, because like I said, that was the capital of, of Italy. So even back then, probably there was um, um, exchange and, and visit uh, at the diplomatic level. Um, Thomas Jefferson, you know, I didn't introduce him because <clears throat> I'm expecting that everybody sort of know that he was uh, one of the presidents of the United States, but I'm not really so sure everybody, you know, everybody or people knows that he was actually a very famous architect back in his time. And um, in this article here also mentioned that uh, he actually entered into the competition for what was called the President House. Uh, and uh, he entered in an anonymous version, so apparently was already famous before becoming uh, president, but he didn't get awarded the job. Um, anyway, a few years later, he got awarded to live in the house. Um, so I suppose he uh, eventually did a good job on that. And um, so this is, uh, you know, I, I think it's a good um, inspirational, uh, if you're interested in to learning more about the connection uh, between uh, Thomas Jefferson, Andrea Palladio, and why so many of uh, these architectural influence the, uh, the United States landscape. Uh, I mean, Monticello is another great example of uh, Palladio architecture. This is a shot of the Virginian uh, campus. But, I, you know, I was in, uh, I think it was Harvard, has similar um, architecture like this, and many universities and all over the place, and in many buildings, library, courthouses, all recall uh, this um, Palladium style, which, of course, comes from the Greek styles. So. Um, well, uh, I think we said enough, for, you know, for what I can say about, um, about architecture and Palladio. Like I said, I'm not really an expert in, in any of those um, uh, subjects, uh, you know, to give a seminar. But I'm, uh, I would say, uh, you know, I enjoy reading about that. So uh, let's talk a little bit more now about uh, how this stone was formed, uh, because this stone uh, has these peculiar characteristics. And actually, just a little uh, step back on, on the stone. Mm, I don't know, I didn't do enough research on this, to, to, uh, but I suppose it was called White House, and I assume because of the color of the material, which was white. And uh, it happened, you will, uh, dis we'll discuss a little bit more here, that uh, Palladio was particularly fond of the white colors. And in our range, and I promise I'm not going to go too much into catalog, but I need to refer to some of our colors, and which we are using pretty much the same color in the same stone that Palladio was using at the time. We have uh, uh, five, you know, five, six different colors, and then depend how you define one from the other. Because of course, there are always gray areas when you're transitioning from one um, item. Will be called today's in commercial terminology or color if you're staying in geological terminology to another because it's stone this a transition. Uh, but we segment, separate them in five, six different colors. Majority of these are two white. Um, there are two yellowish, uh, brownish into grayish color, and we have one white. Um, and Palladio prefer to use the white more than anything else. That's why most of this architecture is white, and that's supposed why the White House was called the White House, because back then, that's how the article called it, it was called the Presidential House. So um, now, step, getting back into the formation of the stone, uh, um, again, here a few little shots from the internet uh, just to uh, remind myself, first of all, and you, is the, difficult, the different uh, um, terminology that was used uh, in the, uh, you know, in determining the different geological era, and also how old the Earth is, or how young we are. Um, if you're looking at the very first uh, stage of life, started 3,500 million years ago, and uh, the human evolution uh, actually only happened 1.6 million years ago. I mean, you can consider yourself and all of us, I suppose, very, very young. Um, and here is uh, you know, a little blow up of the, the, the same terminology. You will see later on, we'll be talking primarily of the Oligocene and the Eocene. Uh, the most important part of this slide, I, I think, is actually this, which measured the temperature of planet Earth from its inception here 
all the way to uh, two days. Uh, I mean, nowadays, uh, where if you are considering disease is zero, you can see that uh, it started actually very high with 14 more centigrades. Um, centigrade. I can't really convert it into Fahrenheit. But I suppose if zero is 32, uh, you know, 14 more degrees centigrade uh, would be like 14 is probably 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Nice. So that gives you the difference. Uh, you know, instead of being the freezing level, you're at 50 degrees. Uh, in sort of in January in New York City. So that tells you about the um, climate uh, change, the climate warming, you know, certainly is due to pollution, but it's also part of geological evolution of the earth. Um, what we will be talking primarily is this phase here in green, which is the uh, Eocene and the Oligocene. This is actually the era of the formation of the Barry Seagull which is the, as you can see, the hottest time of the Earth. Um, just to give you a comparison, this was the great glaciation where the dinosaur extinct. So we are after the dinosaur. And um, so this is just to, to give you the, uh, the temperature. Now, um, and you will see a little bit better in the next slide, that if the global warming is going to take us, uh, you know, back to that kind of uh, temperature level, um, so like, uh, you know, normal 15 Fahrenheit uh, in the middle of January, or the coldest day of January in, in New York City, this is probably the landscape uh, of, um, of the Berichi Hills, uh, where it's basically look more like the Caribbean or the Gulf of Mexico, because that's actually how the, the landscape was back then. Um, if you remember the first slide where I put the Padana Valley, the Padana Valley did exist. The Padana Valley was actually the Adriatic Sea that sort of came all the way to the Alps and the Apennines, uh, and uh, slowly but surely throughout all this millennium, the different rivers and the Fall River start collecting all the debris from the mountain, taking down into, into the sea and slowly but surely filling up the, the Adriatic Sea and creating the valley. And this happened 50 million years ago. And this is called the Eocene, which was uh, primarily, um, you know, landscape of shallow waters, uh, small volcanoes, uh, debris. There's actually quite a bit of volcanic activity still there. Um, Abanotherme, which is another, um, uh, very enjoyable, particularly in the winter. Um, I did that at least in the winter. Um, a very enjoyable, um, I don't know, weekend, day, whatever you want to do, that uh, you can go there and you have thermal water that uh, I believe at 30 degrees centigrade in the middle of the winter, um, which actually is, you know, stem from the earth because of this volcanic activity. Um, so th this is basically how uh, most of our stone, when, first of all, most of our stone formed 50 million years ago and how it formed. So it formed because of this um, debris accumulation and uh, marine sediment. And these are all biocalcarinitis and uh, limestone fossils and the accumulation of uh, nummulite. So in this phase, uh, um, we have what we call the Pietra di Nanto, the Giallo Dorato, Pietra del Mare, Grigio Argento, and Grigio Alpi. So primarily yellowish, and you'll see uh, pictures of those uh, later on. Primarily yellowish and um, gray stone. This will be the Numolitis. And uh, these are only the biggest part that uh, we occasionally collect. This is a shot taken in the museum because um, Grassi has uh, a little section, um, you know, dedicated to a museum uh, right next to the to the showroom and the offices. So I, again, once uh, we'll be able to travel if you come to Italy, uh, either for business or for other reason, hopefully for business uh, with us. Certainly, it's worth dedicating an extra hour or two to um, visit the quarry first, but also spend some time at the, uh, at the museum and, and the showroom. Which, by the way, the showroom is going to be just uh, completely renovated soon. And uh, um, in the next uh, events, um, we are planning to show you also some uh, virtual tours. Um, going back to this, uh, um, most of our stone and our slab are completely made of this, especially the five colors I just mentioned. Um, so that's why also you, you will see uh, some of this formation. And one of the slabs, some, some of you that has been important slab, you can recall in this 
one here um, or even this one um, in the same image that you had in your flat. Now, uh, 20 million years later, um, so we're talking about now 30 million years ago, before we were 50 millions, now we are 30, we are in the Oligocene uh, era. And here there's already a major uh, changes where uh, the coral reef are predominant, this more lagoon, uh, the sedimentation is not as um, predominant like it was before, and there's more calcareous seaweed. So, and this is the time where the uh, white Vicenta stone, or what we call, you know, in our terminologies, the Bianco Avorio uh, is formed. So there's a, comp although when we market and when I, you know, when I'm presenting to my customer, or maybe your rep is gonna come and visit you, uh, we have everything in the same chip box. Uh, you know, remember that in the chip box, there's a 20 million year difference between one sample and the others in, in their own formation. And even, uh, uh, even in the, uh, the two gray, I like to call it five because it's probably a hand, um, you know, like the fingers in your hand. So we have the two gray, the two beige and one white. Uh, even those four colors, actually uh, the, the, the difference is made by the iron content inside that and primarily the oxidation of the iron. So those that uh, oxide the most, uh, the iron basically turn into a rust color and have more of the red and the yellowish that you see in these pictures. The others remain more on the gray and the, and the, yeah, the grayish colors. So the actual uh, geological formation is the same, have a little bit different uh, color variation. This stone here, on the other hand, because of this uh, organic material predominantly into the inorganic, have a whitish characteristics, but also a more dense, uh, dense at the microscopical level, because uh, from a naked eye, you don't really see the difference between uh, one stone and the other. And the actually doesn't even change the absorption of the technical characteristics to a great extent. But from a microscopical level, you will see that um, the white is actually much denser, much uniform than, uh, than the other four colors. Now, this is the, uh, we're going later on, the pre actually earlier, I never know how to describe the, you know, history when it's so far away, but we are now in the pre aboniano so we're going closer to our time. And this is how the uh, evolution of the hill started to form. So is this, because this is a sedimentary stone, so it's a natural sedimentation, you will see that these are different layer of basically different materials. So these are the first part, the first four color, and this is more where the white color is gonna lay on top of that. Um, and again, we have uh, erosion, immersions, uh, casting, those are different factors that started to uh, take effect on the, um, on the material. Now, uh, we talk about uh, sediment sedimentation because most of the limestone is uh, sedimentary and this is where the word comes from. And again, it's another Google, um, uh, Google uh, search that I did online and it's just one of the first images that came, but it's plenty of those. Um, this uh, I think was nice because in three images on top, you will see here the three major macro, macro family of the stone are igneous, uh, the metamorphic, and the sedimentary. The igneous are basically what comes from the core of the earth, um, that are easily, usually erupted through a volcano or a major transformation from the tectonic uh, plaques that moved. And so we're talking about basalt, uh, we're talking about uh, granite, uh, we're talking about uh, this kind of material. And this is a completely different geolog geological uh, formation than the metamorphic and sedimentary. Those two family actually all stem from the sedimentary. They're all sedimentary stone and limestone by definition is sedimentary because basically lime that sedimented one on top of the others. Uh, once the lime, uh, the limestone actually aged further and is compressed by the movement of the earth, uh, occasionally uh, have this metamorphic transformation. So it's only heat and pressure that change the limestone and compact and transform into a marble. 
Uh, so different kind of uh, technical characteristics, different kind of property, not necessarily harder. Um, actually, as a matter of fact, typically the limestone is using outside, the marble is using inside, but uh, th there's so many peculiarity between one definition and the other, and I, we don't really have the time here to dig uh, too much into uh, why one uh, versus the other. Here is, like I said, is uh, our today's material, which is exactly the same of uh, back then, uh, the Palladio one, but this is what we are now calling the Bianco Avorio. And you can see that it's pretty much very monochromatic and it blends uh, very well from one area to the other. So, um, the yellow or the brownish is, this is one of the two, the giallo dorato. You can see that it's definitely more prominent about this uh, uh, shellfish and fossils uh, that are not so dominant in the Bianco Avorio, and so is for the Pietro del Mare, as well as the uh, Grigio Argento and the Grigio Alpe. So this is the uh, material that we are promoting today. Now, if you were to uh, start the quarry, um, this is typically where you would start, probably just uh, you know start uh, taking a hike in the woods, go up on the on the hills and um, looking for a rock, once you find it, you just have to decide where to start. Um, most likely, and you can see that uh, this is actually a rock that has already been uh, excavated. <clears throat> the reason why they started up here, um, we don't know, and we don't even know, at least we don't have the evidence here, when this started, but most likely they started working from up here, and maybe this was all stone um, that at one point they carved here, and then, uh, you know, back then, maybe the Roman time or uh, later on, the mountain uh, through some earthquake just tumbled down, and now this opening, uh, uh, you know, they showed up or opened up. So we don't really know actually how this is, but it is the typical situation that you will face today is if you were to decide to, uh, to open a quarry and to start uh, digging it. Um, primarily deciding you know, where to actually back back then is were deciding where to start and they were carving stone left and right basically uh, based on their um, uh, architectural needs um, and uh, you know try to have it as close as possible to the um, to the uh, application that uh, or the building that you need to uh, to build. So. Um, this is the same, well, actually not the same view, but the, the, the view from the top of the same hill where you sort of get an idea that the Berici hills are actually, you know, a very small, you know, relatively small area, uh, pretty much enclosed, and they're actually um, a handful of uh, valleys. You can see the name here, Leona del Gazzo, del Castro, Sant'Agostino, Palù. Scaranti, and they're, they're pretty much a walking distance, uh, maybe just very high from one to the others. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of the orography of the, uh, of the area. And these are the um, tools and the, the ways that uh, used to be uh, worked. Uh, maybe this is a picture in the uh, early 30 or uh, sorry, late 30 or, or early 40s, so not even that old. And you can see all the workmanship was already, I mean, was still completely done by hand. Um, these large blocks uh, was detached from the mountain and now they were starting to uh, position, to cut, uh, and to figure out a way to transport uh, to a valley. So they were positioning this on these uh, wooden beams uh, and uh, use, it, they use this as a slider to, to get on top of the, um, you know, maybe of a cart and uh, getting down to, uh, uh, to the laboratory. Um, this uh, is a relatively, uh, you know, early picture, you know, by definition, the picture cannot be very old, but um, here there are some uh, terminology that brings us back actually to the Romans, uh, you know, Romani, uh, of course, in Italian is the, you know, a close definition to that. But even Costotta, um, and we have the town nearby, which is called Custoza, which, you know, derives its name from Custodia, uh, which will be custody. Um, so to custody people, because, you know, we discovered that uh, the Romans uh, back then were already uh, custody and, um, you know, imprisoning to this quarry, the, uh, the slaves, that uh, they were to work for their, uh, for their um, uh, 
uh, quarry needs. Uh, so that uh, you know how old the um, the uh, the excavation of this material is. Um, other terminology, many of these are dialects. Uh, tirada is something that uh, you know in Italian is called the tirare to, to pull out. And that's the name to give to the very first lot. We'll see uh, a little bit more in the um, in the next presentation. Uh, you know why why that one is so important. Here is a, another shot of uh, you know other way of uh, looking for quarries on uh, how you will find the quarries. Um, Incendio basically would mean uh, cliff or rock. Um, what is interesting is um, you know how. You know the anthropization that uh, happens to the material after uh, it's been used, it's been exploited, it's been uh, abandoned, and this is the uh, sign of uh, opening of work that had been done in the quarry. So you know you can see here these little line marks are different days or probably even different months that when you're working by hand. And this other picture that we'll show a little bit uh, better later on. Uh, versus, you know, today's technology, you, you will definitely see the difference in, uh, in uh, how to use it. But when you were using chisels, wedges, and uh, and hammer, uh, there wasn't much uh, opportunity um, to use. Here is uh, the first image that we had in the presentation of the actual uh, picture inside the tunnel, uh, inside the, the quarry. So this is a tunnel uh, digging, and uh, you can see that is the ancient way from uh, these uh, little uh, ribs that you see on the stone. And this is what I meant about a messy way of producing a very inefficient way, because when you were cutting by hand, uh, you had a lot of roadblocks, so some area of the quarry particularly hard, or the block came out too big that was difficult to transport. Uh, so many blocks were actually left uh, on site just because not worth spending more time into a uh, frame, into a squared or a more rectangular shape or uh, put it on a slide. Um, that's why you see a lot of these sort of broken uh, lead stone and irregular uh, tunnels all over the place. And of course, a lot of chisel marks and signature in all the possible walls. In these pictures, other uh, uh, tools um, that, uh, you know, back then were uh, actually pretty uh, high and expensive investment for uh, the different quarries, like uh, this uh, jackhammer or this crane over here. Uh, it was really a luxury to have the opportunity to use a tool like this, uh, definitely increased the productivity. Um, this uh, was another way of uh, positioning the, the different blocks, sliding the blocks, and uh, you know when you're thinking about today, it's like unthinkable of uh, what it was um, doing with this material. This, uh, I think, is the most stunning uh, picture because you know two oxen just carry one block, and now it's basically one truck is carrying one block, so it gives you the the power of those animals. But at the same time, those animals was not uh, as readily available as you might think, because uh, I mean, consider those like a, a special uh, piece of equipment today. Not everybody can afford, not everybody has it readily available. And once you have, you want to use it, you want to amortize it. So back then, they were primarily used in uh, agriculture. And so you were quarried when the agriculture had its own downturn, like on the weekend or uh, maybe in winter, um, which actually had the benefit that uh, being inside the quarry, especially when it's in the tunnel, you actually don't have any uh, influence of the outside the weather because, you know, we can quarry inside whether it rains, it freezes, snows, or it's uh, very hot. So that's another, um, you know, nice um, advantage of that. Um, here uh, you can see the, the tracks. Uh, um, usually, the uh, here there the the wooden uh, beams that we saw in other picture were positioned here, and the stone was uh, uh, slide um, down south, down some of, down uh, to the laboratory or to the cart or in you know whatever was possible to uh, to bring it uh, in the most efficient way. In uh, this uh, uh, slide, we see what they call the first uh, recorded marketing of stone. Um, because stone, uh, you know, like nowadays, I suppose, but even more important back then, um, is not readily available where you need it. And if you can think about our situation today, I mean, 
stone is definitely more demanded with the major city are. So New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, and that's typically not where the quarries are. And um, it's easy now uh, to know that you can build your building uh, um, knowing that you can source the material from one quarry or another because you, know, you can visit the quarry, you can meet with the people, you can inspect that. Um, but back then it wasn't so easy to, especially if it was coming from the other side of the world, but um, it wasn't that easy to have uh, access to this information. So the Vicenza region actually put together this um, monography where per quarry, they were uh, registering the capacity of production, uh, how much stone was estimated inside each quarry, and um, you know, giving basically the value of the land because the more you can quarry, the more uh, uh, the capacity of the quarry, the more the value. And also the proximity to the train station, to the railway, because again, that was an important part of the accessibility. Uh, remember, um, you know, like, like back in the past, that Turin was the major capital. So think about, I don't know, maybe, uh, I don't want to say uh, Washington, because probably New York has a higher demand of stone than Washington. But uh, most likely, I'm, I'm thinking about the northern uh, territory here, the northeast. Uh, most of the quarry are actually in, uh, in Vermont, in Maine, in uh, Indiana. And, uh, you know, you have to get to this, uh, to this territory. Back then, it was the same thing from the quarry in Colorado, the quarry in the, uh, in the Veneto region to bring into terrain. So even the uh, access to the train station and transportation was important. Um, in this uh, other slide, uh, we see the estimation of, uh, again, uh, how much is the capacity. You see here the kind of army, the kind of quarry, um, number of uh, quarry open, number of worker, workers working in the quarry, and uh, the same for all the other in the different time. So it was a sort of an inventory of uh, the capacity production of uh, this kind of stone uh, back then. So in 1926, it uh, was estimated that 50 quarry um, employed uh, 334 quarry And uh, this was very relevant to uh, today's time because um, this was, and I, again, I took this from the uh, Longwood Garden uh, um, website, uh, was the time where the Longwood Garden were uh, built. And uh, there's another great, if you go on, on their website, uh, there's another great history and we have video that we will be happy to share with you about the formation of the Longwood Garden. For those of you in, in the West Coast, uh, uh, it's actually a very European kind of garden like Versailles or like the Regio di Caserta uh, that are located just outside of Philadelphia. Uh, beautiful. You know, again, I got lucky. I experienced that before working for Grassi Pietre, but it's going to be another good opportunity to go back into that. And if you can, I will definitely recommend you a, a day or even a few hours there. Um, so looking at this quarry, you can see that it's very similar and you will see more picture of the quarry that we have nowadays. And these are uh, some of the example, you know, the, the, the reference that I'm using. This is the uh, Longwood Garden today. Um, they were originally uh, designed in the, in the 20s, uh, but they actually have been uh, uh, re, um, uh, how do you say, it? refurbished, um, uh, renovated, re renovated is what I was looking for, uh, re renovated just uh, five, six years ago. Um, so, this uh, I think is another great uh, advantage uh, of the stone because uh, not only you can see in this picture here we can do with the stone any shape and forms and dimension, but uh, we can also redo it uh, exactly the same or reproduce something else that can very well blend uh, the same material that was installed a hundred years ago. So this is something that is not always uh, available with many other, especially the man-made material. A couple of other pictures here of, uh, of, the, uh, of the reference. And I think it's a perfect one uh, because, you know, it's not Miami, it's definitely a cold environment, it's outside, it's in contact with water, um, definitely snows and freezes up here. Um, so it's a great reference for, for many of the projects. 
back in the old time. Uh, this is the gangso uh, that uh, were used by hand. Uh, for those of you that uh, has been in the laboratory of um, hopefully will visit us uh, in Italy, we'll would be happy to show you the gangso today. And uh, in one of those later uh, events that we are planning, um, we will be talking uh, more in details and showing you a picture of what it is. So this striking the contrast of what it is nowadays and uh, what it used to be. This some of the other uh, tools uh, that uh, are in the uh, quarries. And these are the quarries uh, that are today being used by Grassi. These, uh, you can see here the evaluation, pretty much the same uh, <clears throat> inventory that I was showing before. Here is actually in a graphical term and I have better details in the next slide about uh, these uh, uh, quarry down here, where you will see in this case exactly how it's quarried. If you remember the, the previous slide of the formation of the hills, the sedimentation um, allows the material basically has a specific level uh, where it lays. So this is the level where we want to quarry the material underneath this other material that we cannot use for architecture. So it's above, it's just dirt and trees and um, that you know probably is useful for other material for other purposes, but definitely not for quarry. So this is the advantage of uh, working in a tunnel. And, you know, like anything, there are pros and cons. Um, the pros is certainly that you go straight to what you need without having to remove any excess material. If this was an open quarry, we would have to uh, remove all the excess. I hope you can see the mouse here. Um, remove all this excess uh, and then eventually uh, re uh, once you terminated working, reestablished the original condition, replant. Um, so all accessory work that is not necessary when you're working in the tunnel. Um, the downside, actually the other, uh, you know, upside is what I explained a little bit earlier. You can work here pretty much any day, any time. Um, you know, it's an environment uh, with uh, pretty much controlled um, uh, conditions. The downside is, and you see it better here in the plant, uh, that uh, it's like a multiple tunnels. So you have tunnel going uh, in two different directions, primarily orthogonal direction. So you have all these pillars here that uh, you need to leave it. Otherwise the mountain on top is gonna, you know, crash uh, and crumble on top of you. So for every quarry that is technically exhausted, that there is uh, practically another estimated that 50% more material uh, that you can extract. And the estimation is about 30% of the pillar and 20 on the ceiling. Now I don't remember whether it's 13, 20, 20, or 30. But bottom line is, uh, you know, once you extracted everything that you could, uh, there's still the same capacity that technically could have been extracted on the quarries. So uh, once the, uh, this is the, basically the entrance uh, that you see on the quarry, and uh, that's what I meant in the picture on the right here, is the same view from uh, Google map where we put here the dot because we know where the entrance are. Other than that, you, you wouldn't then, you know, recognize one different from the other because when you are in front of it, I mean, if you just don't pay too much attention, you can just walk by or drive by. I mean, most likely there's a road next to this and you just uh, drive by. It's not much different from any other turn that you have on this uh, winding street. There's, you know, no much than a garage for a big, uh, big truck. Um, so this is the uh, entrance of today's modern quarry. And this is what is the modern quarry inside. <clears throat> Actually, this you see from the ceiling and from some of this pillar, you know, how irregular these are. You can see that this was excavated back in the time. Uh, at least started and because it still has capacity. Now we can enter with the caterpillar and the track and do a little bit more modern excavation. But this is a perfect contrast and you know, the seating definitely show you the, uh, the older time of this quarry. Now, this is how we excavate in today. You see that uh, it's much more regular cutting and the picture um, next is gonna show you the final effect. Um, what is interesting here is how are we cutting the material? Um, consider that you, you are in a hole inside the mountain and think about a, a tunnel. Uh, you are inside that, but you don't just dig in order to go through and to make a hole. 
which is very simple because you basically, uh, you know, grind everything until you get on the other side of the mountain. That's technology used in, uh, in you know, in highway um, uh, architecture. Here, we don't want to grind the material. We want to take it out, but take it out intact. So it's a much more complex way of digging. Um, and the way we, uh, we approach is that we have this wall. We cut this wall into squares or rectangles. And uh, we start cutting into the rectangle, open this, uh, you know, this line, these cavities, you know, as much as we can, uh, keeping them as tight as possible because uh, we don't want to, like I said, grind too much material. We want to keep it intact and attached to the block. But at the same time, we need to be able to wiggle this block until it eventually breaks in the back. So we have to cut here these four sides cut more or less at the same depth, be careful not to cut in a different uh, depth one from the other, and not only that, hope that it breaks very regular. That's how you obtain the best block. And the first one to get out typically is the one on top because of course we're using gravity and everything that is uh, advantageous in nature like cracks in the stone uh, as much as possible. Um, the very first one is the hardest one to take because when you think about this, you know, you have a flat wall and you gotta go through that and this feet and feet or yards and yards of, of uh, material very hard that it's not that simple once you got the first one you have another angle how to cut the rest out out but the first one is certainly challenging also with today's technologies uh, same approach once you uh, moved into the mountain the same approach if you have material you gotta move down on the ceiling um, Sorry, yeah, move, uh, dig in the ceiling so that uh, the floor actually, I mean, um, digging down on the floor so that you are uh, getting the block out of the floor all the way until, um, you know, the material is pretty much exhausted. And this is what we are seeing in this picture here. And basically, again, the challenge is how to get the first one out. Once you get the first one out, it's easier to cut horizontally on the, on all the others. Next is the picture of a quarry, pretty much, uh, at least in this section here, exploited and exhausted to the maximum. So we keep on going. This is where this uh, big uh, uh, caterpillar is coming from. Maybe, you know, we still have uh, a few yards in the back that we can exploit it, but you can see compared to the other uh, quarry, how more regular the ceiling is. I mean, it looks almost perfect, the, the pillar perfectly square. Uh, the floor is, you know, you just need the, the tile on top of it. It's pretty much a, a regular warehouse. Um, all the way to uh, this picture here, where it actually is a warehouse, where the blocks are uh, wrapped, the number um, dated, uh, the number is giving you the bench we are uh, extracting that so that we know where it's coming from. Um, you know, all of you that works in stone know the stone has its own natural variegation, and that's the beauty of the stone. But at the same time, you need to make this variation as nice blend, not the patchwork of, um, you know, different uh, type of grades. So that's why it's important to follow the same movement that the nature um, built uh, this, um, this formation and the shapes. And these are the pictures of uh, how the blocks are being extracted, uh, pulled out of the, of the mountain and uh, loaded on the track. So completely different from what it was the oxen and the manual labor in the past. But then eventually the quarry is exhausted and uh, this is typically the way uh, it will be and the nature will uh, take over. You usually close it uh, to a fence so that uh, nobody can go into, you know, into trouble because it's definitely very dark and you can get lost in there. Uh, so you want to make sure that there's all security possible. But other than that, there's no major other risk. I mean, so you got to basically look for trouble. Nothing else will happen. Um, this is what you will see from the interior. And the question typically sparks is, okay, but now, you know, we use this, uh, is there something else that we can use uh, or we can take advantage of that? And because we are actually inside the mountain and, uh, you know, it's pretty much like in any other storage area, you have a free warehouse. Um, so why not taking advantage and taking advantage of the benefit of such a free warehouse? Um, remember, it's uh, constant humidity, constant temperature, no light, 
And there are certainly uh, merchandise or products that can benefit from there. The only inconvenience is the problem, you know, no problem, definitely in a more remote area. But once you're working with um, big material, and you can see here mushroom cultivation, you don't need the mushroom cultivation in the center of Milan or New York City. You can certainly, you know, transport uh, mushroom from, you know, the, the place of production to the place of storage to the place of um, consumption uh, fairly easily. Um, this is mushroom, but uh, um, we have many other uses. Uh, another use, of course, is the shootings. Um, you know, what best than uh, already a dark uh, environment where uh, you can do your own shootings? Uh, um this before was a lighting company this we have a safety company um because it's pretty much the same you are inside nature and um, it's, i can tell you it's particularly impressive be, being in that environment um concert uh, i've never been to a concert but definitely uh, i think it's an experience that i would like to uh, take advantage if i um hear one and uh, many others, uh, speleologies. Um, one of these quarry was actually uh, discovered uh, underground stream, streams. Uh, so stalactite and stalagmite. Uh, so there's a lot of things that can still be done with the quarry. Wine cellar, of course. I mean, wine, vinegars, uh, salami, cheese, uh, you know, what best condition that underground, including common fish uh, restaurants. Um, one of these quarry was actually converted into a museum, um, so they call Zove Sendo, uh, because the area is in Zove, and uh, you're basically looking at the way the farm, the lifestyle of the 1950s uh, was up to. Um, so it's a kind of a, a, it's a many different opportunities that all your imagination can, can go and limit. Uh, this is a museum. So on top of the showroom and the warehouse and the laboratory, we can actually, uh, we actually feature a museum inside one of our quarry. And uh, I can guarantee you these are pieces that uh, have uh, probably been uh, used as a prototype for some of our projects. And again, this is one of the topics of the next uh, presentation that we will uh, do as a follow up of these uh, talks. And uh, you know some of the you know the best one, the one that came the the more the, the nicest that we are using in this uh, museum uh, collection, where we can have tools for architects, designer, client, uh, school students. Uh, you know you can sign your name over here the way it used to be done. And uh, typically we terminate uh, a presentation like an event like this, so with a uh, little conviviality, like uh, some, um, you know, salami and music. Um, unfortunately, I can't really offer anything of this today. So I'll give you here the bibliography that has been used. Um, these are our content and it's pretty much uh, the end uh, of uh, our conversation. Um, I went a little bit over what I was planning to do. I hope I didn't bore anybody at this point. Um, I don't know if you have some questions, uh, Maria Vittoria. I don't know if you received any comments or any chat or um, if you want to, you know, give some, uh, open this, this, the, uh, the microphone so that uh, maybe somebody want to interact. I didn't see any comment actually, Giorgio. I don't know if there is any kind of special question right now. Otherwise, I just have to, well, there's somebody, oh, great. Thank you, thank you, Vince. Uh, Vince came to visit the quarry and actually he also took part to a pair of times there when we had some dinners there. And well, of course, you know, I think this time we tried, there's a question, sorry. Okay, Vince, do you wanna talk? Um, if you wanna unmute you, just a second, let's see. Dacom, if you can help me finding Vince. Okay, uh -huh. okay I found it. Lisa, you are on my... Hello, hello. Hi. Giorgio, great job. Really good speech. I like a very informative, too. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Mario Vittorio, Giacomo, good to see you. Good I had a question. You. Hi, Vincent. I'm, I'm working on a couple of projects for mm -hmm. exterior stone. Yeah. And I'd like to know your opinion about how um, Pietri Vicenza... Uh, works in a rain screen facade mm -hmm. in a spa area. I'm sorry, I didn't get it. Where is it? 
in a freeze thaw area. It's in a cold area. So I want to. In a cladding, we have the biggest, our biggest uh, seller in, is in Germany, actually. So, you know, it's, uh, we do have quite big reference there for facade. I'm okay. happy to share with you the reference there. Yeah, I would like to get that from you. And also the thickness of those facades in rain screen. What is your typical thickness? Uh, it's normally three to four cm. So okay. it's one inch and a quarter, something like that. But of course, it depends uh, on the dimensions, on the way that you install it. But anyway, my technical would be more than happy to share that with you. I think the worst we have in Germany dates back to the the 18th century, which actually I have no idea how they supply the material there. Of course, we don't have track down, but we made some renovation last year. So that was a nice project. That was in the white. Well, you know, of course, uh, today, the more common that we're selling the last four to five years is gray, but I mean, it depends on what you like. That's you no. Know. So we have big reference on these kind of things. There's, it's okay. I mean, we have all the tests, of course. Very good. I'd like to schedule a talk with you guys. Very good. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Good job, Giorgio. Yeah. Giorgio, tell me about your your background. Are you a geologist? No. <laughs> uh, no. Um, well, I study I study architecture in high school, and then uh, I I went to business, and it seems I was always in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, <laughs> and then uh, my after university, uh, I. I came to the United States and I traveled the world as a uh, sales manager for the porcelain industry. Okay. And then from porcelain, uh, I don't know, maybe because the uh, architectural study were when I was in my uh, teenage years and 20s, so that's what I liked the most. So I got sucked in into architecture and architecture by definition wants more the natural material. That's how the stone basically crept in more and more into, into my history, into my background. Now you have the passion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now I have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you. Well, I was saying, you know, uh, that's, uh, we would love to have you, everybody. We always want to invite people to see the quarry because quarry is a, is a spectacular place. It's not a place that you can, seeing the photos is nice, being there is a different thing. So when you enter there, you are in, you have different spaces, you hear the sound different. I mean, we made some concert there. It's, it's so different when you hear people singing inside there. So we are, in right, right now we cannot invite you, but we are happy, you know, as soon as things are over and this problem will be solved with hopefully, you know, in a pair of months, come here. If you plan to be here for September for the show in Marmomac, Take an extra days, let us know, and come and see that in reality. We're more than happy to host you here and see you because once you go there, you it's a different place. I mean, normally we always want you to try that. And right now what we can do is just show you the, on the video, but at least imagine that. And we really hope to have you here in Italy as soon as possible. Okay. If there's, there's somebody here. Okay. That's I just wanted to thank you for the uh, presentation. It was very interesting. I enjoyed it very much. Um, yeah, thank you. And again, if you have any comments, we, we are not professional presenter. We just, like I said, want to um, have this chat interaction uh, because there's always a way of saying uh, this, you know, like in the project, uh, we don't have one standard size. I mean, of course, the majority of that, but each one has its own peculiarity. And there's so many things that I've forgotten now that I'm over. I should have said this, I should have said that. I mean, uh, it's part of it. And that's why I think the interaction and the chat is, is helping making this, um, first of all, interesting and easier for whoever is presenting, but also for whoever is listening, because your question might be interesting for somebody else, might help somebody else think something, something else. And if you want to interact, I mean, you see, I don't know if you still see my screen, but I put my contact and uh, grassy contact. Uh, we certainly have yours, but especially for me, I was focusing on the presentation more than see who is there. And uh, um, I prefer sometimes to have a little bit of solicitation because it's easier to respond rather than bombard everybody that maybe just attended because, you know, had nothing else to do. Because, you know, there's also this part, but hopefully I inspired and we inspired some of those too.
So everybody seems to be happy. We will share some, uh, some people were asking for some uh, videos about the quarry. We have a lot of them. I just hope that, uh, you know, you have the time. We will, have, we have something out in our YouTube while well, Giacomo just put out our... Yeah, I posted one, but if you want to just type YouTube and the Grassy Pieta, you will find something yeah. more. But we are more than happy to share videos or picture with you whenever you, you 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 may need okay excellent well thank you everybody for your time and the participation and uh, hope to uh, hear from you soon sure. i was asking if we have uh, a distribution in chicago actually there should be online i don't know if it's still here jay he's selling our material out of chicago jay is present Okay, so Angela, if you want to uh, share your email, uh, either with Jay Sackett, which is here, or you can email me and I will be more than happy to put you in contact with him. No problem. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, any other question that you have, feel free to email us and we will help you through. No problem. Okay? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Rose. Okay. Thank you, everyone.